Okay, class. Um, let's talk about physiology of motor control. Now, I know you've taken anatomy before, so this will be a good review of neuroanatomy and a little bit of physiology. So understanding where the lesion occurred in the body will help decide uh, what kind of deficits that you might see in a neurological patient. So, hey, what do you see right here? First thing that comes to your mind. So some of you will see good, but some of you will see evil. How many of you see that? Aha, uh -huh. yep. So it's all perception, right? So perception is key, and can you deceive that perception? All right, so it's very interesting. All right, so Hippocrates says, Men out to know that from the brain and from the brain only arises our pleasures, joy, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears. Through it, in particular, we think, see, hear, and distinguish the ugly from the beautiful, the bad from the good, and the pleasant from the unpleasant. So it's all in our brains, right? Again, goes back to it's all perception. So again, uh, we just uh, review some neuroanatomy here. So major landmarks, the cerebrum is 80%, oh, I'm sorry, 83% volume. Uh, cerebellum is 10% volume, but 50% of its neurons. Crazy, right? And brainstem has the smallest volume, but crucial for survival. So these are the different parts of the brain. Again, so you have two cerebral hemispheres, the right and left. It's uh, attached with the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum basically uh, connects the right brain to the left brain. You have the frontal lobe, you have a parietal lobe, and you have a occipital lobe here. So you have two cerebral hemispheres. You have a gyri, which are folds, sulci, which are grooves. You have a longitudinal cerebral fissure, which is the big sulcus between the hemispheres. Again, the cerebellum looks like a cauliflower shape. It's only 10% of the brain volume, but it has 50% of the neurons. And the brain stem, such as the medulla oblongata and the pons, is crucial for survival. So any injury to the brain stem is your, your chance of survival is very slim. Okay, again, surface anatomy, you got the frontal lobe, central sulcus, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. Here's another view of it. And here's some different aspects of it. Again, this is not an anatomy class, so I'm not going to uh, quiz you. And uh, you should know most of this already. So again, just to refresh your memory, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. Here's the cerebellum. Here's the pons, medulla oblongata. Here's the pituitary gland. Uh, um, again, these are, this should be a refresher for you. If not, maybe we need to take some anatomy. <laughs> okay, so here's the brain. Again, medulla oblongata, pons, cerebellum, occipital lobe. And the reason that I'm going over this is as we, uh, we talk about motor control, motor learning, if you have a damage to a specific area in the brain, and then it will give us kind of guidance as to, okay, what are some activities that would be affected? What are some things that they would have deficits in? All right, so gray versus white matter. Gray matter is the outer part, the cortex of the cerebrum and the cerebellum, as well as the deep nuclei. You have the neurosomas, the dendrites, and the synapses are all gray matter. White matter is deep in the brain. Those are the tracks. Those are the bundles of myelinated axons. Your meninges, you guys, you have the meninges. So here's your skull right here. And then you have the dura matter. Then you have the arachnoid matter. And then you have the pia matter. So the dura matter is a tough outer layer. The arachnoid matter is transparent middle layer. And the pia matter is the delicate inner layer. The dura matter with cranium, the dura has two layers. You have a periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Uh, you've heard of meningitis, uh, that's inflammation of this layer. In some places, the layers separate to form dural sinuses, um, superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, that's an opening. In some places, dural sheets occupy spaces separating major parts of the brain. 
You have the Fox cerebri between the hemispheres and Tentorium cerebellum between cerebrum and cerebellum. Again, when you study for the quizzes, don't study all this. I'm, these are just refresher uh, courses when we actually get to the actual portion, but this is leading up to the physiology of motor control. So hopefully you know all this, but uh, am I going to quiz you on this specific stuff? Not Okay, meningitis, again, that's inflammation of the meninges, uh, happens in infants and childhood. Um, could be bacterial or viral, uh, enters through the nose and throat. Uh, the PN and our arachnoid layers are affected. So what do you get? Swelling in the brain, cerebral bleeds, and possibly death. Uh, the telltale sign of meningitis, uh, this, this could be on the quiz. Uh, high fever, stiff neck, drowsiness, vomiting, and he headaches. blood supply to the brain and the blood brain barrier so brain is only two percent of the body weight but receives 15 percent of the blood and uses 20 percent of oxygen and glucose so you have this thing called the blood brain barrier bbb it seals capillaries in brain tissue has tight junctions between the endothelial cells it's highly highly permeable to alcohol caffeine nicotine anesthetics so alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, SX can go in and out of the blood-brain barrier at no problem. What it can't do, and it's not permeable to, is antibiotics or cancer drugs. That's why it's very difficult to treat cancer of the brain, the glial cells, with chemotherapy because the blood-brain barrier stops it from crossing it. So that's why only surgery and radiation is kind of the go-to cancer treatment for brain. Now you have a blood CSF barrier which seals cord plexus within the brain ventricles and you have tight junctions between the ependymal cells. So again, uh, really understanding the blood-brain barrier is important because then how do we treat it? What are some medications? We always have to have medications that will pass the blood-brain barrier. So let me give you an example. When you take Advil, you don't get high or you don't get uh, crazy drowsy or irritable because it doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier. But when you take Vicodin, Percocet, uh, all those uh, uh, pain medications, they do pass the blood-brain barrier. That's why it gives you those uh, wicked dreams and feel makes you feel upset, nauseated, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding the blood-brain barrier and what uh, medicine can pass it will maybe affect your patients and what some of the side effects that they have. The medulla oblongata, which is part of the brain step, develops from the myelencephalon, extends from the foramen magnum to the pons. And the medulla oblongata is important because it's the cardiac center. So the rate and force of your heart rate is regulated there. It has the vasomotor center, which regulates your blood pressure. Uh, the respiratory center, so rate and depth of breathing is regulated there. And speed sneezing, salivation, swallowing, vomiting, and sweating there. So if you have a patient that had damage to the medulla oblongata, then all these important things can get affected. So this is why uh, knowing a neuroanatomy, and this is why knowing the physiology of this is important, because then we would deal with that patient a little bit differently and say, oh, this patient has damage to the medulla oblongata. Uh, um, th these are the things that we could see. Now, patient with damage to the medulla oblongata is going to be uh, uh, very difficult to treat. I'll tell you that. Now, um, medulla oblongata, you have the cortical spinal tracts, um, inferior olivary tracts, reticular formation, tectospinal tract, posterior spinal cerebral tract, fourth. Again, I'm not going to spend time going over what all these tracks do, but remember you have tracks that go up and down your spinal cord up to your brain, and these tracks relay motor and sensory information, um, whether it's pain, whether it's touch, whatever the case may be. So if you, if you don't remember that at all, that's uh, something that you may want to review. I'm not going to quiz you on it because, again, it's not a neuroanatomy class. But once you start working with the neurological patient, uh, knowing which tracks are affected would uh, help you significantly. Here's the brain stem. Uh, there's the thalamus. Here's the midbrain. Here's the pons. And then the medulla oblongata. And then you have all your cranial nerves. Remember all your cranial nerves, 1 through 12? <clears throat> and then you have the superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. One does speech. Uh, vision and one does hearing so the cerebellum 
This is like a walnut shape, cauliflower shape, uh, uh, cerebellar hemispheres. You got the vermis, uh, cortex of folia and sulci. Uh, okay, numerous granules. They call it the arbor vitae, tree of life, under the white matter. So this is called the tree of life. And you have a deep nuclei. Okay, so that's the cerebellum. Now, <clears throat> what does the cerebellum do in an injury to the cerebellum? We're going to talk a lot about this. Uh, uh, throughout the semester, but understanding where it is first and then what it does. So it fine tunes your motor control. Okay, so the cerebellum does, okay, so the frontal cortex of your brain gets you from point A to point B, right? So cerebellum will control the speed, the velocity, the accuracy of that gait pattern. So when you have damage to the cerebellum, your gait pattern is gonna look completely different than if you have damage to the frontal lobe. And I'll give you examples later. So here's the gait pattern. If you look at cerebellar ataxia, okay, so that means difficulty walking, you have damage to the cerebellum. Uh, you're going to have a staggering wide space. Signs are dysarthria, dysmetria, dysdiokinesia, intentional tremors, nystagmus, and Romberg's. What can cause this? You can have cerebellar degeneration, a stroke, MS, thiamine, vitamin B12 deficiency, and alcohol. Sensory ataxia is unsteady, worse without visual input. You have impaired uh, position and vibration. Uh, what causes? You have issues to the dorsal column and neuropathy. So that could be someone that's diabetic. Vestibular ataxia is unsteady, falling on one side, postural instability. You could have nausea, normal sensation, but nystagmus. What causes that? Usually something with the inner ear, meniere's, acute labyrinthitis. Uh, and some patients are just a cautious gait pattern. They're slow, wide based, like they're walking on ice, um, usually because uh, they have a fear of falling, open spaces associated with anxiety. And what causes that? Deconditioning, maybe they've fallen before or they can't see real well. So you can, as you get older, you'll have the cautious gait pattern. This gait pattern is because they have damage to the cerebellum. This gait pattern is because they're diabetic. And this gait pattern is because they have uh, issues in their inner ear. So the diencephalon, uh, you have three parts. You have the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Here's the thalamus, a large ovoid mass that makes up four-fifths of the diencephalon. It's the gateway to the cerebral cortex, involved in sensation, movement, memory, and emotion. I like to call the thalamus kind of like the airport or the railway station, right? Everybody ends up at the airport and then based on where they're headed, then they'll take different paths. So what happens is all this sensory and motor information goes through the thalamus and then it's the thalamus's job to kind of distribute it within uh, the brain there. So it's kind of a very, very important relay center. The hypothalamus, uh, that's important, extends from the optic chiasma to the mammillary bodies. It provides the major control of the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. What does it do? It functions. It secretes a hormone called oxytocin, not oxycontin, oxytocin. Okay, and that's responsible for childbirth. Autonomic uh, uh, effects, heart rate and blood pressure, uh, thermal regulation, food and water intake, hunger, your sleep and circadian rhythms, emotional responses, your sex drive and memory, new memories between the hippocampus and cortex. So the hypothalamus is huge. Imagine if you had a patient that had damage to the hypothalamus. Well, then all this would be affected. So now you're understanding why I'm talking about this before we go on with motor learning and motor control is that understanding where, and you're like, well, Patel, how would I know where my patient has damage? Easy, read the medical chart, read the MRI, read the CT scan. It'll definitely tell you um, where it is. Now here's a very interesting uh, uh, circadian rhythm uh, that most people follow. Some of your circadian rhythms are totally off. Uh, so I don't blame you because of uh, student lifestyle. But if you think about this, okay, 4.30 in the morning, you have the lowest body temperature, about 6 o'clock. Most heart attacks happen between that 6 early in the morning because you have the sharpest rise in blood pressure around 6.45. So heart attacks occur early, very early in the morning. About 7.30, your melatonin secretion stops and you naturally should wake up if you follow this circadian rhythm. So without an alarm clock, 
you naturally wake up around 7.30. And some of you can say, oh, yeah, Patel, you're right. I wake up at 6.30 no matter what. Or some of you wake up at 9 o'clock. Uh, depends on how uh, uh, off your circadian rhythm is. All right, so when you wake up, you're probably like, oh, man, I got to go poop. So around 8.30, uh, you probably have a bowel movement. Uh, and now you're like, oh, man, Patel, I have class between 8 and 9. I can't do that bowel movement. So you do it before you hold it. That's fine. You have the highest testosterone circulation around 9 o'clock. So that could be good for lifting weights or making babies. So you choose what you got to do. <laughs> what I recommend uh, for most people, their highest alertness is around 10 o'clock. So taking a class that's very difficult uh, around 9, 10, 11 is going to be very beneficial because that's when you're going to have uh, highest alert. You know, in India, they don't actually uh, start school until 10 o'clock. So they go from 10 to 5. Uh, uh, so it makes sense, you know. Um, certain uh, cultures, they start a little bit later, but then they end. It makes sense. But you do have the highest alertness as 10. Noon, maybe lunchtime, your best coordination is around 2.30. So that's why after school sports, it makes sense to have them after that. And your fastest reaction time is around 3.30. So participating in after school uh, sports around that 2.30, 3.30, 4.30 mark is actually very, very good. Now, your greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength is 1,700, which is around 5 o'clock. So really going to the gym and doing cardio at 5 is probably better than doing cardio in the morning if you follow this normal circadian rhythm. Again, your highest blood pressure is around 630. And then your melatonin starts to secrete around what? 9, 10 o'clock. And then around 10, 30, 11, you usually don't have a bowel movement unless you have a, a GI disturbance and ate Taco Bell or Del Taco. Then you might have bowel movements all night long. <laughs> but usually your bowel movements, you don't wake up in the middle of the night to go poop because uh, bowel movements are suppressed usually. Okay, so very interesting circadian rhythm. Obviously, if you have uh, damage to the pineal gland, which some of your uh, neurological patients will do, then their entire circadian rhythm is off. So uh, scheduling therapy when they're the highest alert and the having the highest uh, um, reaction time might be good. And you're thinking, well, how do I know that, Patel? Well, you ask them. You ask the family members and say, hey, uh, when does Mr. Uh, Smith get sleepy? When does Mr. S uh, Smith have the highest attention? They're like, oh, yeah, he's he's great in the morning, but he wants to sleep at night. Well, then don't make any uh, uh, therapy uh, sessions in the afternoon. It's going to be nonproductive. So understanding and talking to the family uh, uh, is very, very crucial. Okay, the epithalamus, the pineal gland, endocrine gland, um, the habenula, which is the relay from the limbic system to the midbrain. The cerebrum derives from the embryonic telencephalon in the form. It allows you to turn pages, read and comprehend words, remember ideas, talk about them, take exams. You have the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, again, those are separated by longitudinal. Again, I'm going fast because this is review of anatomy, but very interesting stuff. Uh, again, the lobes of the cerebrum, so the frontal lobe. Um, uh, is for cognition, speech, and motor control. So damage to the frontal lobe will uh, have issues with cognition, speech, and motor control. The parietal lobe damages to the parietal lobe. You'll have damage interpreting signal of general senses and taste. Uh, damage to the occipital lobe will damage your visual center, so difficulty seeing. Temporal lobe, damage to the temporal lobe. You'll have difficulty with hearing, smell, learning, and memory. And then damage to the insula, you'll have damage and difficulty with taste, visceral sensation, and language. So there you go. Will this be on the quiz? Probably. So I'm understanding that. So again, this is a great way to understand lobes of the cerebrum. Here's the frontal lobe. Um, abstract thought, explicit memory, mood, motivation, foresight, planning, decision making, emotional control, social judgment, voluntary motor control, and speech production. So damage to the frontal lobe is going to cause a lot of problems. Now damage to the insula, which is a little deeper, that's going to damage uh, taste, pain, visceral sensation, unconsciousness. Then you have parietal lobe. If you have damage to the parietal lobe, you'll have issues with taste, somatic sensation, sensory integration, spatial perception. Okay, so spatial perception is damage to the parietal lobe. Uh, 
occipital lobe, visual awareness, and then the temporal lobe is hearing, smell, emotion, learning, language comprehension, verbal memory, and language. So um, going back and uh, reviewing your anatomy is going to be crucial to help you uh, in this class later on. Cerebral cortex, uh, surface of the hemispheres, 40% mass of the brain. Again, vision is a separal lobe, hearing is temporal lobe, equilibrium is your cerebellum, taste is parietal lobe, and smell is temporal and frontal lobes. Here's the uh, homiculus. You've probably heard of this. Um, but again, you have the primary somatosensory cortex, which is the post uh, central gyrus right around here. Okay. And that does what? Somatosensory, so sensation. So if you look at this, look how much uh, uh, it's dedicated to your tongue, teeth, and cheek. Your hands, look how much dedication is into your brain for just your hands, your feet. Okay, so the tongue, the cheek, your teeth, and your hands have a big role of sensation in your brain. Okay, now motor control wise, uh, if you look at this, this is the precentral gyrus that does motor. You have a, a big dedication to your tongue. Uh, look how big your hands are as far as in your brain. So a huge section of just controlling the hands. So you can see uh, from an OT standpoint, occupational therapy, and this is this is big time for a neurological patient. Um, again, uh, left hemisphere versus right hemisphere. Um, this is where you uh, had you cross your hands. And if you see your right thumb is on top, that means your left hemisphere dominant. So uh, you're good with verbal memory, speech, right hand control, uh, feeling shapes with right hand, hearing vocal sounds. You're rational, you're symbolic. You have superior language comprehension and vision on your right field. If your left thumb is on top, uh, you're, you're good with memory for shapes. Um, left hand control sometimes uh, you're good with feeling shapes with the left hand uh, you're good at hearing non vocal sounds so you're good with music musical ability uh, intuitive you're, you're very good with nonverbal communication uh, superior recognition of faces spatial recognition right so you're you know pros and cons to both sides but you can see if you have damage or a stroke to the right hemisphere what could be damaged and if you have damage to the left hemisphere what could be damaged so does that make sense? So if somebody has a left CVA, they're not very rational. Okay. So there you go. So if you have someone that's damaged to the right hemisphere and you're going to try to do music therapy, well, it doesn't make sense because they had damage to that area. So understanding what is beneficial would be uh, good to understand. All right. What do you see here? You see Wolverine. Or do you see two Batman? Interesting, right? All right, let's take a break.